Hello mes amis, welcome back. I love kings and generals, but when I saw they released a video with a slightly provocative title on Napoleon and the way he subverted the French Revolution, I thought it was going to be fun to react to it. And I was kind of amused because if one of our big French YouTube channels wanted to do the same title, oh my god, it would create a civil war in France. Before I'm going to defend my Corsican friend, I'm going to disclose my opinion on all of this. I like the guy. I'm proud that he's part of my country's history. But I see he's, he had many, many, many flaws. I do not worship him for he did serious, serious mistakes. But my opinion on the topic of today is that Napoleon did not subvert the revolution, not at all. On the contrary, he managed to cement some of the main aspects of the French Revolution. Did some of its actions were highly controversial? Yes, absolutely. But first, let me start by asking a question. When we talk about the French Revolution that Napoleon is supposed to have subverted, what is this revolution we are talking about? Do you talk about, for example, the early stages where we try to sort of have a constitutional monarchy? Do you talk about the terror, about Robespierre? Do you talk about the corruption of the directory? Then. What was France like when Napoleon came on the scene? And who runs the country at this stage? We have to define all of this in order to assess whether Napoleon did or did subvert anything. And these are honestly things on which French historians still keep on fighting. So with that being said, let's go. In 1789, the social fabric of Europe was thrown into chaos and disorder by the commencement of the French Revolution, during which the people of France rose up against their king and oppressive nobility, demanding their voices be heard. Within three years, the monarchies of Europe were at war with revolutionary France in what would become the War of the First Coalition. It was during this war that the French monarchy would be abolished and in its place would rise a new republic, idealizing liberty and fraternal equality. However, as the French Revolutionary Wars raged on, a promising young French artillery officer would see his career skyrocket through the ranks of the Revolutionary Army and government until this man, Napoleon Bonaparte, would one day seize the reins of the revolution and subvert it for his own self-interests. Welcome to our video on how Napoleon subverted the French Revolution. So I don't agree with what they say, but they say it so epically that <laughs> I almost want to forgive them. If you start a video using the music of Napoleon Total War, how do you want me to defend myself? No, I cannot. What bothers me more seriously is the way they present it reminds me of power grabs of 20th century dictatorship where a young hero guides the people in their thirst for justice before revealing his dark side like Anakin Skywalker and taking all the power for himself. Actually, no. What's the stake of the French Revolution? First, is to bring food on the table for the people so that they stop starving. Then is social justice, the idea that every man are born and stay free and equal in terms of rights and duties. And they are not defined by birth, but by the merit of their actions. The Corsican-born French army officer Napoleon Bonaparte, who initially signed his name in the Italian fashion of Napoleone de Bonaparte until 1796, was 24 years old when his name first gained the notice of his contemporaries. The young artillery officer's first step in climbing up the social ladder of revolutionary France was not achieved through fighting on the battlefield with sword in hand, but rather by writing with the pen in the office. 
In 1793, Napoleon wrote a political pamphlet supporting the French Revolution, titled Le Souper de Beaucaire. This pamphlet, which marked his first rise into public relevance, was a narrative dialogue between two travellers in an inn. In this story, two merchants from Marseille attempt to convince their fellow inn guests, a soldier, an artisan from Montpellier, and a citizen of Nemours, how their city is justified in revolting against the revolutionary government in Paris. After a heated back-and-forth argument, the soldier ends the debate by proclaiming that the citizens of Marseille have no justification, whatever their grievances, in throwing their home country into a state of civil strife and chaos in the midst of a war against foreign invaders. The soldier states that any refusal to obey the Jacobin government in Paris in such a trying moment is both treasonous and counter-revolutionary. Through this political pamphlet, Napoleon expressed his open support for the revolution, and directed his opposition towards the pro-monarchist regions of southern France. Napoleon's Le Souper de Beaucaire was by no means a historical groundbreaking work, but it did suit the dire circumstances surrounding revolutionary France at the moment it was written. So the soldier in the Soupe de Beaucaire is obviously Napoleon himself. And he was inspired by a real life anecdote in which Napoleon had a lively discussion with some Marseille merchants and they ended up getting drunk until two in the morning. So I don't think there's any real agenda behind this pamphlet. Uh, it's a young man's pamphlet written in the same way he wrote, for example, an erotic short story. Napoleon had the thing for writing and you don't have to put an agenda behind everything he writes. For he had authored the piece while passing the time in General Jean-Baptiste de Carteau's army, which was operating against pro bobor counter-revolutionaries in southern France. His pamphlet soon gained the attention of a close Bonaparte family friend, Antoine Christophe Salicetti, a fellow Corsican who held influence as a political commissar in the revolutionary government. Salicetti introduced the pamphlet and its author to his friend, Augustin Robespierre, brother of the famous Maximilien Robespierre. Augustin appreciated Napoleon's Jacobin tone and pro-revolutionary message, and grew to like the magnetic personality of Napoleon. Jacobinism is maybe a notion that, has, that is hard to define. It's, um, it's more a concept than a political movement. I will try to grossly say that these are democrats, technocrats and bourgeois. You have both moderate and radical parties within this movement. For example, Robespierre is an important figurehead of Jacobinism. And this movement is going, I think, to be massively associated with Robespierre and the terror and the, and the industrialization of the guillotine. And before long, he was approving of all of the young Corsican's recommendations and ideas, even those policies which clashed with his military superiors. So began Napoleon's rise to prominence, from a lowly and obscure artillery officer to a name with some note and merit in the revolutionary ranks. Through his connections to Salicetti and Robespierre, Napoleon earned an appointment to the staff of General Carteau in the Siege of Toulon in late 1793 where he first earned his reputation as a battlefield commander by leading the French Republicans to victory over the British and pro-royalist forces that December. He was hailed as a hero for his role in this victory and was quickly promoted to Brigadier General. However, Napoleon's connections to Robespierre were soon cut short, quite literally, when the latter lost his head to the guillotine in 1794 at the end of the Reign of Terror. As a colleague of Robespierre, and having previously been sent on a secret diplomatic mission to Genoa, an enemy of revolutionary France, Napoleon was made a suspect in the terror and was thrown in jail by none other than his old friend Salicetti, who was trying to save his own head in the aftermath of the coup against Robespierre. Any illusions Napoleon might have had about the ideals of liberty and common brotherhood in the French Republic were now being cast into doubt with the brigadier now realizing the extent of the corruption and intrigue within the revolutionary government. Nevertheless, they are trying to define this moment as the, yeah, the birth of the dark Napoleon. But I would say in the first place that Napoleon was 
always somebody who was deeply pragmatist and he was no stranger to the hardships of his era. So I don't think that this was such a defining moment for him. Napoleon continued to believe that the revolution was a cause for good within France. Bonaparte was released from prison by his erstwhile friend Salicetti and put to work in the Army of the West, suppressing counter-revolutionary royalist revolts in the Vendée region. Objection, Your Honor, that's not true at all. Napoleon never went to the Vendée. So Vendée, for those of you who don't know this horrible, horrible episode, is a civil war in the a region called Vendée in the western France where you had a royalist and Catholic uprising. Troops of the Republic were sent there. It was very inexperienced and undisciplined troops and sent there with very vague orders. And this degenerated into horrible exaction, mass murders. Actually, it was probably the most terrible episode of the revolution. If Napoleon would have been there, it would have seriously damaged his reputation and I bet you wouldn't have ever heard about him for. Most of the Republic's generals who were sent there were later tried for war crimes. For some time, Napoleon actually considered transferring his military services to the Ottoman Empire having become incredibly disillusioned with the poor management and chaotic administration of the revolutionary armies. By October of 1795, Napoleon... By the way, look at the size of France then. The policy of expansion didn't start with Napoleon, even though he would bring it to another level. But when Napoleon arrived, France was already huge and waging wars of conquests. Napoleon was in Paris, working with the Bureau of Topography in the Committee of Public Safety, when a royalist revolt broke out against the ruling National Convention in the streets of Paris. Bonaparte continued to show his loyal convictions to the revolution's cause when he was tasked by convention leader Paul Barras with taking charge of Republican forces in Paris and suppressing the riots. In one of the most notorious acts of his early career, Bonaparte ordered his artillerymen to fire grapeshot from their cannons into the gathered angry mob, violently suppressing the riot in an event that became known as the 13 Vendémiaire. Toulon so once things for sure, Napoleon has a heavy end when it comes to restoring order. What they are calling riot is actually a royalist insurrection with 25,000 men, many of them armed, trying to surround the convention. Napoleon ordered to fire canister shots on the crowd, killing 300 royalists. And afterwards, Napoleon was nicknamed the General Vendémiaire. And came to be seen as the savior of the Republic and gained a lot of popularity there. Napoleon had built Napoleon's early military reputation, while the 13 Vendémiaire had solidified his political career. Barras and other grateful leaders of the convention, who now formed a new government known as the Directory, hailed Bonaparte as a savior of the revolution. And before long, he was promoted to the rank of General of Division, with command over the exhausted, ill-equipped and underperforming Army of Italy. Napoleon's military career only grew with his string of victories in northern Italy during 1796-97, where he galvanized the demoralized French soldiers under his command and earned a reputation as a fearsome general. His troops even fondly nicknamed him the Little Corporal for sharing in their dangers on the battlefield. With his decisive victory in the Italian campaign, Napoleon single-handedly forced the Austrians to sign a treaty which ended the War of the First Coalition, bringing about a fragile peace in Europe after five years of conflict. The people of France revered the victorious general as a hero and saviour. It was here that Napoleon's path to despotism truly began, as he started to realize that he had won the war, not Robespierre, not the convention, and certainly not the current directory. He famously remarked privately, I am only at the beginning of the course I must run. I can no longer obey. I have tasted command and I cannot give it up. The 
If you've been following the, my review of Bonaparte's Italian campaign, another constant thing is that he received very, very little support from the Directoire, even though he was begging for help. And what he managed to do with what he had, and especially at such a young age, at the end of the day, yeah, of course, you are going to develop a thing for ambition and power, but... It's legitimate because you've earned it. And he signed the piece of Campo Formula himself, negotiated with the Pope, administered conquered territory and reformed there. So um, it's pretty much on its credit. And the blame is to put on the directorate because they failed to assist this young general. The peace in Europe did not last, and within a year, Napoleon was planning his next campaign against the British in the War of the Second Coalition. He set his sights upon the vast deserts of Egypt, where he saw an opportunity to cut off the British Empire's trade connections to her colony in India. But more than that, Napoleon's campaign in Egypt was to be a scientific and cultural expedition, bringing with him France's best historians and scientists to study the land of the pharaohs and bring back riches and glory to the French people. The campaign would ultimately end in military failure for the French, but politically, Napoleon's expedition had done what he had sought it to do. It served to increase his fame and popularity back home. When Bonaparte returned to France, in 1799, he received a hero's welcome. Napoleon reached new heights of fame and glory, while already a master propagandist. So actually, the Egyptian campaign was a military disaster. He failed in Syria and he abandoned his army to return home in disarray in face of internal turmoils. But it's perhaps one of the most iconic pieces of his legend and an incredible success in terms of image. But on the other end, that's where kings and generals could really uh, have said a lot more on his appetite of power. They could have speak about his war crimes there, the way he tried to deal with the Muslim populations, the way he imagined himself as an absolute ruler. Uh, and the impact all this campaign had on Napoleon as a person is not the same Napoleon that returns from Egypt. Uh, and I think if you want to find out a dark Napoleon or a moment where he's really altered by events, it's there. It's during the Egyptian campaign. Now the directory reached a crisis point. Corruption and greed plagued the directory, and its legitimacy was cast into doubt. And Napoleon began seeking a way to seize power for himself, to take the reins of the revolution personally. Paris was already seething with political intrigue and backroom deals. He saw that the time had come to make his power play against the revolutionary government. He made a political alliance with a plotter in the directory, Emmanuel Joseph Sillez, who sought the popular general's support to take power. On November 9th, 1799, Napoleon's plot was set in motion. Actually, the, the story is the opposite of that. In fact, it's Sillez who calls Napoleon because he needs a sword to maintain order. But it could have been someone else like General Joubert or Masséna or even Bernadotte. CIS organizes the coup and Napoleon executes it. The plan was to force the dissolution of the Directory's legislature, vote in a new parliament, draft a new constitution, and effectively renew the government with a clean slate, with Bonaparte and CIS legitimately voted into power by the parliament. CIS, through his connections and bribery, would ensure that the other leaders of the Directory would be unable to oppose the motion. Napoleon gained the support of the other senior military generals for his plot, winning them over through bribes or his charm. Napoleon and his plotters believed that force would not be required to get such a resolution through, and they didn't want to be seen as taking power through a military coup. Napoleon relied on the support of his brother, Lucien, who had been elected president of the lower house of the legislature, the Council of 500. He hoped that Lucien would be able to sway the legislators to dissolve the government, but the council refused to listen. 
Deliberations continued inside the chamber, as Napoleon and his co-conspirators waited outside with growing impatience. Finally, the young Corsican's patience grew thin, and he entered the building accompanied by a retinue of grenadiers to deliver a fiery speech to each chamber in turn. Although the Council of Ancients relented, the 500 refused to hear him out. The deputies rose from their seats, shouting hors la loi or outside the law, with some members even drawing daggers on Napoleon. Bonaparte and his grenadiers were driven out of the chamber, and he noticed some of his generals were visibly hesitating on their next move. Had the council declared Napoleon an outlaw, things might have gone differently. But their indecision would prove fatal to their power, and the French Revolution as a whole. Drums beat outside as soldiers charged into the chamber accompanied by Napoleon. The deputies began to disperse quickly, many rushing to escape the frenzied scene through the room-level windows. In a quick and decisive coup, Napoleon had effectively dissolved the Directory. With the fall of the Directory, a consulate was voted into power, in which three co-consuls would lead the French Republic. Napoleon, Sillez, and a co-conspirator, Roger Ducos, later to be replaced by Charles-François Lebrun. But for all intents and purposes, Napoleon had consolidated power for himself as the first consul of the French Republic. Much like the waning years of the Roman Republic, the true revolutionary ideals of liberty and fraternity faded away under the consulate, or rather, dictatorship of Napoleon. So, you have to define dictatorship. If you're thinking about 20th century dictators, it's absolutely not the case. Maybe the, the parallel they draw with Jules César is interesting. A dictator is somebody who received the full powers in a time of crisis in order to solve it. When he becomes the first consul, France is actually facing a huge crisis. People are starving because of the external blockade, because of the war, and an economical crisis. You have unrest in the country, a lot of thefts, riots. You have civil wars in some areas of the country. So the first order of business is to appease France and then, then to secure the progress you've made during the revolutions by using legislation and administration. He had seen how the various governments and legislatures of revolutionary France had thrown the country into chaos and disarray, and Bonaparte intended to put an end to it by gaining absolute power. Working vigorously from his office in 17-hour workdays, Napoleon oversaw the rapid transformation of France from a republic into a one-man dictatorship. There were some positives out of Napoleon's consulship. He did away with the hectic revolutionary calendar, created a new legal codex known as the Napoleonic Code, the basis for much of modern Europe's legal codes, and also established general order and stability in France. But for all intents and purposes, the French Revolution, or at least the ideals it had birthed, died on November 9, 1799. Most Frenchmen didn't oppose the new consulship, as Napoleon brought stability to a France that had seen nothing but chaos and death for over ten years. Yeah. Napoleon went on to win another string of victories over the coalition forces in his second Italian campaign, culminating with the Battle of Marengo in 1800, which solidified Napoleon's status as first consul of France and ensured the new government's continued stability. Now holding uncontested absolute power over the French people, Napoleon would finally cement his rule over the country in 1804 by holding an election which made him Emperor of the French. Once an idealistic revolutionary like many of his French brethren, Napoleon Bonaparte had subverted the ideals of the French Revolution for his own gains and become the very thing he had originally fought to oppose, an absolute monarch. We hope you enjoyed our video on Napoleon's rise from artillery officer to emperor. We plan to cover the fascinating lives of history's other great leaders in the future, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. So absolute leader, if you see at how quickly he was ousted of the country by French elites in 1814, his throne was pretty unstable. The, the fact that he was coronated as an emperor is a political move.
in order to appear more acceptable for the other European rulers. And he tries to do so in order to secure external peace. And at the same time, with the Code Civil, he tries to secure the gains of the revolution, and that will be is a structural problem for him. So I think it's a two-part video. Anyway, uh, I will quickly follow up on the part two. Um, let me know what you thought of all of this, and talk to you soon, guys. Bye.